Mr. Allen, what is in room 237? Nothing. There ain't nothing in room 237. But you ain't got no business going in there anyway. So stay out. You understand? Stay out. Previously on Lost. Ah, f I mean, Stephen King's The Shining. The boiler, she creeps. The whole place is gonna go Rocky Mountain High one of these days. If you have something you want to say, why don't you just come right out and say it? The board has decided to put an alcoholic less than a year away from his last drink in charge of one of the greatest resort hotels in America. Weren't you told that the bottle and I have parted company? Hey, Doc. It's dangerous. <laughs> Take your medicine. Get over here, you take your medicine! I uh, guess you'll take your medicine now, my nasty little friend. You think they were coming to get you, Doc? Of course not. They're just tetanus. Nice to know you, Mr. Halloran. Dick, please. Uh, Mr. Halloran, I'm sorry, Dick. Dick! Hey, Dick. 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 Bye, Dick. I'll lock the door first. Why? There's no imaginary pal who comes and shows you the future. Now, will you stop with that crap? Ah! Oh! Ow! Can I keep it in my room, Mom? Do you think that's... It's fine. It's fine. They're all dead, guaranteed. It is the ugliest thing in the universe. Of course, my son wants it in his room. Go on, Doc. Be my guest. Yeah, I think $5,000 a sting should do it. Huh? Don't you think? Tomorrow, I want to make an appointment with that doctor. Released on April 28th in 1997, Episode 2 continues the misadventures of the Torrance family during their stay at the Overlook Hotel. This episode is... Kind of fun. In a schlocky made for TV sense, but it has its moments. Oh, oh. Hello, get back. Oh, oh. Steven Weber and Rebecca De Mornay are starting to find their footing within Jack and Wendy, with lengthy scenes allowing them to flesh out their characters. I want us to get in the snowmobile and get down to Sidewinder right now. Wendy, look out the window. Are you blind? Zero visibility. Unfortunately, their co-star is still struggling to finish his lines properly. Gosh. Sure, use the cold one. The cracks begin to show on the writing and direction side of production. Daddy? Where I genuinely feel bad for what these actors are given to work with. Bobby? Yeah? Some of the dialogue is so corny, so on the nose, so amateurish. You forget that it's written by one of the most popular and critically successful authors of all time. So, King, take us on a journey to the Overlook as the evil spirits settle into their rooms along with the Torrances. Shall we? Episode two decides to shake up the formula and not open to credits over black. Instead, we open up the episode with Jack attending an AA meeting, featuring a cameo by the director of the series, Mick Garris, whose screen time correlates with his production credit. That's cute. We cut away to reveal that it's October 21st, the day after the Wasp incident. <laughs> Wendy stayed true to her word and took Danny to see a doctor the next morning. This scene mirrors that from the 80s film with a psychiatrist, telling us essentially the same information. There's nothing physically wrong with Danny, Tony is an imaginary friend, and that there's been a fair degree of stress in their marriage lately. I suspect there's been a fair degree of stress in your marriage lately. The doctor tells her that Tony may act as a coping mechanism for Danny to deal with loneliness, help ease the stress. As Wendy begins to tell him that Tony can see the future, he How did Danny break his arm? cuts her off. Isn't this a pretty groundbreaking revelation that this child is claiming to be clairvoyant? You don't want to touch on that a little more? Wendy relays the story of when Jack broke Danny's arm while drunk, but he's been sober for five months now, and currently in an AA meeting. But all I can think about is how claustrophobic I feel while watching this. Just pull the camera back a little, Jesus Christ, the over-the-shoulder framing this is so distracting. Did she ever hit you, Mrs. Torrance? Oh god, no. Never. <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> 
After Wendy tells him how things are getting better within the Torrance household, despite wasp stingers and chips of porcelain still lodged in Danny's skull, the doctor elaborates on how perceptive Danny is, saying, He knew when things were wrong between you and your husband when he needed a Tony to help him get through. He knows now things are better and Tony can take a hike. Sir, I do not believe you have a grasp on the capabilities that Tony possesses. It's dangerous. You didn't even acknowledge the fact that his mother said Tony can see into the future. Wendy then asks if Danny is making Tony unpleasant to get rid of him. It's one strategy that imaginative children use, yeah. I'm not gonna get into end of series spoilers just yet, but just trust me when I say, there is no possible way Danny can get rid of Tony besides redacting himself. Jumping forward a few days, it's now November 1st, with Wendy and Danny playing on the swings. Oh hey! Jack is relieving the pressure of the plot device again. Jack wanders over to the storage room, finding boxes and boxes of newspapers from decades ago, as well as a memory book from the Overlook Hotel. Whose memory book? He finds an invitation given by a Horace M. Derwent, the same man Jack and Ullman mentioned who restored the hotel in the last episode. And like I said in the last episode, I actually kind of like this iteration of Jack's obsession. It's pretty tame in the beginning, he's just interested in learning about the hotel, and it does have a flashback which is kind of useless, but it's fine. I guess, because it comes across more as a daydream rather than a retelling of events that will be explained again the moment they come back from the flashback. He reads further into the scrapbook, getting a brief history of the hotel until a jump scare makes him throw the book on the ground, catching a glimpse of murder for a few frames. Suddenly he begins hearing things, and like his son before him, turns out to be ghosts committing crimes. How about this? Now Jack starts to piece things together. There's an entire history of organized crime and murders at the Overlook being kept under wraps from the public. Here's an example of a flashback being kind of effective and not completely irritating, at least in my opinion, because the inverse of this would have Jack just say all of this out loud, which would be extremely irritating. We're transported back in time as he reads the article. And you know it's back in time because it's in black and white. Seems these fine gentlemen are serving a nice plated meal. I hope they're hungry for nothing. I hope you're hungry for nothing. They're actually serving up some lead salad, which turns the screen to color for a couple of frames during the muzzle flash. Was this an intentional stylistic choice or an editing mistake? I mean, either way, it's super weird and distracting. We get a little montage of newspaper headings of all the crimes committed at the Overlook. Shotgun, crime, gangland, murder, mutilated, cheap, dumbass. Jack drops the scrapbook on the ground as it closes on its own, running around the corner of the room, then looking back like a cat after it knocks some shit off the counter. Just like mine love doing. November 2nd rolls around, and the hotel is starting to see some snowfall. Fun fact, production had to spend upwards of a hundred grand on snow machines for this effect, as the Stanley Hotel falls in- ah! Oh, sorry, just wasn't expecting that thing to be in the window. As Danny watches snow blanket the ground, more ghostly whispers call to him. Wendy rushes down to ask what's wrong, which he immediately drops the second she brings up making a snowman. Do you want to make a snowman? Sure. Cool. Daddy too? Okay, let's go get daddy. As the 97 Torrances play around in the snow, showcasing a heartwarming scene of a family bonding, let's check in with the 80s Torrances and see how they settle into the hotel. After the conversation with Halloran, warning Danny of the dangers within the hotel, we cut to a month later. Just within this one establishing shot, there's already a tremendous sense of isolation, further captured as Wendy wanders down the vast hallways by her lonesome, pushing a cart carrying Jack's breakfast. The total silence, spare echoing wheels and footsteps, really sucks you into the environment. We then cut to Danny riding his big wheel. Kubrick flexes the new Steadicam technology of the time to great effect here, trailing behind Danny as his wheels hit the hardwood floors, then muffle over the carpet in a rhythmic fashion making the stillness and the air uneasy. The mirror motifs make another appearance as Wendy brings in Jack's breakfast, giving us some interesting and creative shot compositions, utilizing multiple framing techniques in a single shot lasting a minute and 23 seconds. It's already apparent in this scene that the hotel seclusion isn't doing Jack any favors. Wendy asks Jack to take her for a walk, but dismisses it. Oh, I suppose I ought to try to do some writing first. When asking if he has any ideas yet, he confirms lots of ideas, but no good ones. When Wendy attempts to comfort him, saying it's just about getting into the habit of writing every day, Jack retorts. Yeah, that's all it is. 
his true condescending and resentful feelings towards his wife already bleeding through. This particular mirror often shows Jack's nefarious side throughout the rest of the film, reflecting the facade of a man Jack portrays to his wife early on. They discuss the hotel, with Wendy admitting that she thought it was a little scary at first, and Jack admitting he instantly fell in love with it, almost like he's been there before. It was almost as though I knew what was going to be around every corner. This line not only acts as a little nod to the audience for satirizing horror conventions, but gives some great foreshadowing for the themes and events later on in the film. Foreshadowing doesn't stop there either. As we crossfade out of the bedroom into the main lobby, an empty typewriter sits on the desk as Jack throws a tennis ball at the wall, which sounds eerily familiar to an axe tearing a door down. Jack's mind is already somewhere else, not on the writing project he came here for, but certainly, subconsciously, on his partner and child. This is expanded upon as Wendy and Danny take a walk through the hedge maze, as the incredible composition by Bella Bartok's music for strings, percussion, and celeste wrap the scene in a thick fog. Traversing through the maze, the sky is completely blown out, no discernible features of clouds in sight, a white void. As the piece hits one of the first musical stings, we fade back to Jack in the front lobby, tennis ball striking the ground in synchronicity. He makes his way to the model hedge maze, towering over it. We meet his perspective in an overhead angle, revealing a far more complicated and expansive web of trails, visually similar to the cortical foldings of the human brain. A slow zoom in gives the impression of inner reflection, seen in other sequences of the film, and with Jack as the ultimate observer, implies the maze represents the inner workings of his mind, the epicenter of which, being Wendy and Danny, an unignorable distraction. A warped perspective of family relations is already being established, where Jack will use his family as a scapegoat and misdirect blame for his incompetence. That bitch. As long as I live, she'll never let me forget what happened. It is so fucking typical of you to create a problem like this when I finally have a chance to accomplish something, when I really end my work. They're nuisances the ultimate goal to interfere with his task as the winter caretaker. A problem that needs to be corrected. There's a little detail here that I don't see a lot of people bring up when Wendy learns about the upcoming snowstorm from the television. She talks about a woman who's been missing for 10 days after a hunting trip with her husband. Now, I don't know if you've listened to literally one true crime podcast in your life, but let your imagination fill in the details. I don't know what happened to her. We went out hunting in the middle of the woods by ourselves, and she went missing, officer, I swear. Albeit brief, the inclusion of this news story acts as further subtle foreshadowing for the violent rampage Jack will enact on his family later in the film, Wendy and Danny potentially ending up missing in the Rocky Mountains. Music for Strings, Percussion, and Celeste make another appearance as Danny rides around upstairs in the hotel, coming across room 237. Giving in to his own curiosity, Danny approaches the door, attempting to turn the handle but it seems to be locked. A quick flash of the twins pops into Danny's mind before cautiously returning to his bike, hurrying away. The score lingers as we dolly in, Jack finally sitting down, writing. As Wendy approaches from around the corner, we can see a scrapbook, the same one from the miniseries. A crescendo of strings is accompanied by Jack ripping the page out the typewriter, Wendy giving him a kiss. Wendy asks Jack if he's gotten a lot written today, to which he begrudgingly says yes in a flat tone. She changes the subject, telling us the weather forecast predicts a snowstorm coming, to which Jack also begrudgingly asks, What do you want me to do about it? More of Jack's true colors bleed through this scene. It's extremely uncomfortable, and unfortunately far too familiar for many people. Whenever you come in here and interrupt me, you're breaking my concentration. You're distracting me, and it will then take me time to get back to where I was. Understand? From merely asking how things are going, trying to have a conversation with a loved one, all to be thrown back in your face and further blamed and verbally abused into submission. Honestly, the more I view this film, I find the most disturbing scenes to be ones like this. It's real. Unfiltered. And you can't help but feel empathetic for Wendy, especially if you've been in a relationship like this. Jack isn't so overly animated it becomes fun like he does later in the film yet, so when he makes remarks like this, Whenever I'm in here, you hear me typing. 
Whether you don't hear me typing, what the fuck you hear me doing in here when I'm in here, that means that I am working. That means don't come in. How do you think you can handle that? Yeah. Why don't you start right now and get the fuck out of here? It's absolutely crushing. Okay. As Wendy walks away, something has awakened within Jack now. The clicking of his typewriter strings together a familiar sentence. Thursday. Snowfall. Familiar scene, right? Wendy and Danny play in the snow, but something is brewing. A ringing in the ears. The white void is encroaching around the Torrance family, closing them off from the outside world. Jack's gaze pierces through their souls with the trademark Kubrick stare, quietly going insane. The white void from the maze now reflects his entire environment. There is no escape. He is forced to inhabit his own mind, where his two largest obstacles are wrecking havoc. Saturday. Heavy snowfall covers the hotel in white. What once was a beautiful scenery now lays barren in the winter. Jack continues his writing in the center lobby, as cold and desolate as the environment which engulfs him. Meanwhile, Wendy attempts to connect to the phone lines, which have blown over in the winter storms. She heads to the CB radio found in Ullman's office, calling in from KDK-12. This is KDK-12 calling KDK-1. This brief scene establishes that now, truly, the only form of communication to the outside world is through this CB radio. Let's just hope Jack doesn't get any other ideas brewing in his head. Now we're back with Danny on his big wheel. A shrieking score echoes through the hallways until we find ourselves in the back rooms with white and blue wallpaper. Another visitation, but this time an invitation. Come and play with us. Come and play with us, Danny. Their siren call gets interrupted by a grotesque scene. Blood stains the walls as Danny's vision comes to fruition. The mangled corpses of the twin girls sprawl across the floor as Danny can do nothing but cower in horror. His hands slowly uncover his eyes to reveal an empty corridor. In an attempt to process the unexplainable, Danny seeks guidance and comfort from Tony. Remember what Mr. Halloran said? It's just like pictures in a book, Danny. It isn't real. Let's talk about the twins. Despite only having two on-screen appearances, the twins have become one of the most iconic aspects of the film. From the quotes to cosplay and apparel, these two have cemented themselves as a staple in horror and cinema alike, calling back to Ullman's warning of the potential dangers of isolation. The twins serve as a representation of exactly that. There is a nefarious undercurrent brewing within Jack, where Wendy and Danny could end up butchered in the hallways of the Overlook in the aftermath of Jack's wrath. They could also symbolize Danny and Tony, connecting the two as twins themselves, who stand in the headlights of Jack's encroaching insanity. Whether or not the twins are actually physically present in the hallway or act as a projected metaphor is up for debate, but I'll get to that later. One thing is certain, however, if uninterrupted, Wendy, Danny, and Tony will end up just like the Grady family, with Jack fulfilling his duty as winter caretaker by any means necessary. That was all pretty great. Now let's check back in with Steven and his interpretation. Now it's November 19th. Which, before we get going, I want to talk about timestamps. In the miniseries, they continually use it to show a passage of time. I mean, obviously, that's what a timestamp is, but after a while it seems to get a little redundant. We can already tell the passage of time through crossfades, dips to black, and even establishing shots showing the progression of snowfall. But they even go as far as spelling out exactly when the last day of their stay at the Overlook is. Now, you might be saying, who are you to criticize the usage of timestamps in the miniseries, but not the film? Well, this is because in the film, all the dates are ambiguous. Tuesday. Wednesday. Saturday. The lack of specific dates reinforces the themes of abusive relationships, where despite the horrible mistreatment of family members, it's just another Monday. Just another Thursday. As the film progresses, we do start getting more specific time frames like 8am and 4pm, which acts as a ticking clock element and further reinforces these themes simultaneously. Not only is it just another Friday, but another 4pm, even closer to the collapse of the family unit. 
Okay, back to November 19th. A fresh blanket of snow covers the overlook as we find Jack shoveling out the steps. And back to my fun fact that was so rudely interrupted, production had to spend upwards of 100 grand on snow machines for this effect, as the Stanley Hotel falls in a snow shadow of sorts, where the surrounding mountains and terrain block much of the snowfall, but they unfortunately forgot to add snow to the roof. Oops. Danny plays with his action figures until he hears some ghostly whispers calling for him yet again. This next sequence seems to be a combination of the two scenes from the 80s film, but just a bit more clunky. Missing are the twins, of course, as that was an addition to the Kubrick film, leading the miniseries to miss out on some great visual metaphors. As he wanders down the hall, he passes by room 217, and as he does, the fire hose from earlier seems to move on its own. Tony appears as Danny walks up to the door, but how this played out, I'm not sure he was supposed to be in this shot. Doc! What are you doing here, Doc? Or maybe he was, but this musical sting made it seem like it was a surprise. Doc! I suppose it was for Danny, but we saw Tony earlier. It's just not well edited. I don't know what they were going for here. Anyways, Tony tells Danny not to go into the room, but Danny blows him off, saying he's not scared of them. He said nothing here could hurt me. They're like pictures in a book. Doc, if you give them the chance to become more than I that, they can- I go in here if I want to. Go away. Leave me alone. After making Tony disappear with Halloran's method, a ghost lures him to come inside the room. He grabs a chair to look into the peephole, but that's not how they fucking work. You have to use it from the other side, you're not gonna see shit. Some water leaks out from under the door as Danny goes to Ullman's office to grab the master keys. On his way back, Danny and the firehose have a staring contest until Danny finally notices the puddle emitting from under the door. At this point, he's literally asking to get strangled, you fucking idiots, I don't care. Danny. <laughs> Tony gives us another jump scare with genuinely weird ass phrasing. You can't let them touch your mind, ever. Do you understand? <laughs> As he's running away, he stops in his tracks because of the fire hose. It's not even doing anything, just fucking run past it. Nothing here can hurt me. Just like pictures in a book. I don't let them touch my mind. Blood spews out of the hose, but Danny counts to 10 and it's normal again. Just a hose, stupid. At least make it jump towards him rather than adjacent. Like, Jesus Christ. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? I've got the whole world to see. As Danny brings back the master key, Jack catches him red handed. What are you doing? Nothing, Daddy. He questions him further, asking if he was messing around with a CB radio, mentioning that if the phone lines go down, it's the only way they have for calling for help. The only way. Roads west of Boulder continue to be treacherous. Jack asks Danny what he has behind his back, marking the beginning of Jack's slow transformation into obsessing over the hotel and following the rules, hounding his son for disobeying. Not supposed to go into any of the guest rooms! He sits down and starts chewing aspirin between his molars, something he used to do for hangovers while he was hitting the bottle. Worst one in a while. Jack stands back up, going full discipline mode, inquiring about what to do about a boy who cannot keep to the rules. How are we gonna make you remember? Are you gonna hurt me, Daddy? Like before. This strikes a nerve in Jack, empathy swarming in as he backtracks his statement. Meeting his eye level, Jack pleads with Danny, saying he'll never hurt him, but that rules need to be followed. And men follow the rules. The scene is fine, pretty much establishes what it needs to, drawing a line with Danny, firmly restricting him on where he can wander around in the hotel, reinforcing that the CB radio is their last line of defense and not to mess with it, and the patching up of relations between father and son. Jack doesn't want to hurt Danny, but he gets lost in the inner frustration that boils to the surface. But it doesn't have the same impact that the father-son relationship scene from the 80s film has. Monday. Directly following the encounter with the slaughtered twins, Wendy and Danny watch the summer of 42 while snow encases the environment. Danny asks if he can go to his room to grab his fire engine, but Wendy warns that Jack is sleeping, not to wake the bear, in a sense. Danny goes anyway, promising not to make a sound. As we crossfade into the bedroom, Bartok's composition chimes in, the ambience of a winter storm still lingering. Danny slowly approaches as violins heed warning. Every time the camera whip pans, landing on Jack sitting at the foot of the bed, my heart sinks. We cut to the reverse, Jack now composed within the mirror. All eyes on Danny. He asks to get his fire engine, 
but Jack beckons him closer. The tension can cut glass as Jack sits his son on his lap, pulling his arm closer with Danny retracting backwards. You can see where I'm going with this. He plays with his hair, softly asking how his son is doing. For the next two minutes, we are subjected to one of the most disturbing sequences in the film, all the action conveniently placed below frame. This scene, in conjunction with the butchered twins from the last scene and Danny entering room 237 in the follow-up scene, shows the true horror of the film. Jack is sexually abusing his son. The music editing works perfectly in tandem during this sequence. Check out this video I already mentioned last episode if you want a deeper dive. Jack's hand slides down Danny's arm, his eyes matching the movement as the score peaks at the point of arrival. Dad? The dialogue seems directly influenced by the score, with the ebb and flow, the pacing, the diction, all correlating in synchronicity to the actions on screen. Dad? Yes? Do you feel bad? On a 120-second continuous two-shot with no coverage that wasn't even supposed to have music in the first place, the anticipation of a response, answered by the chilling composition, strings us along during the bedroom talk from the depths of depravity. When Danny asks Jack if he likes the hotel, with his son's hand on his groin, a familiar phrase leaves Jack's mouth. I wish we could stay here forever and ever. Danny is caught in the actualization of his vision Dad? as his father echoes the words of the twins. You would never hurt mommy and me, would ya? The score, again, answering for Jack when he can't bring himself to do it. We break from the shot to reveal Danny open palm, twiddling his fingers, giving the suggestion of masturbating his father. Jack pries into Danny, asking if his mother ever said that to him, that Jack would hurt him. He assures his father that she didn't, with Jack promising that he'll never do anything to hurt him. With one of the most menacing declarations of love, Jack lies through his teeth, leaving the rest of this scene for the dark recesses of our imagination. I love you, Danny. I love you more than anything else in the whole world. I would never do anything to hurt you. Never. This marks the point of major deviations between the film and miniseries. Sequences in the second act of the film appear in the third episode, while sequences from the third act appear in the second episode, with many scenes not within the film at all sprinkled in between both episodes. So bear with me, we'll get through this together. I will chronologically go through both the film and the miniseries, with these differences ultimately culminating at some point. After the 97, Danny and his father have a little chat about following the rules. It's now time for bed. Danny tells his mother that Jack isn't working on his play, as he's down in the cellar rummaging through old newspapers. Wendy warns Danny not to go down to the cellar, but he must have learned his lesson from earlier. Been down there. I'm not supposed to. It's a rule. The men follow the rules. Great A parenting. Good job, you did it. They talk a little bit about his shining abilities, letting it slip that Jack now has abandoned writing his play altogether, spending his time reading about the hotel instead. What do you mean he's not writing the play, Danny? Of course he is. That's why we're here. You know how important that play is to him. Jack has now shifted to wanting to write a book about the Overlook. The scene continues with Wendy asking Danny more shining related questions, like if they should leave, and if Jack has started drinking again. Is your daddy drinking again? Do you know? Which doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't you know if your husband has been drinking? You interact with him on a daily basis, right? And how would he even get it? You're snowed in. He thinks, gosh, I can sure use the cold one. You want to do another take of that? You kind of stumbled over your words a little bit. Did you have a couple cold ones? <laughs> Wendy asks about Tony, mentioning how he hasn't been around all that much, until more ghostly whispers reveal red rum written on the wall. Blood starts pouring from the letters, and Danny gives the most nonchalant excuse. What's the matter? Did you see Mr. Spooky in the corner? You made to look dirty, Kurt. Stole your mother's pocketbook. Ha ha ha. Now lie down. 
It really comes across like they were exhausted on set this day. There's such an awkward vibe during this scene. Like they're just trying to hit their marks. Bobby? Yeah? God bless De Mornay's heart. This is the face of a woman who is so fucking fed up acting opposite of this child. What's red rum? Red drum? Not drum. Rum. Red rum. I don't know. Sounds like something a pirate might drink. <sighs> what are you doing to me, Steven? Give this woman something to work with, please. December 8th rolls around, showing that the timestamps are increasingly becoming irrelevant to the story. Jack comes up from the basement, and after seeing the mess Danny made in the lobby, throws a bit of a fit. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we're gonna have to have a little talk, aren't we? When he comes from around the corner, and she wants to fuck. <laughs> You know, your son's been playing down here again. I've got a pocket full of his action figures. Oh, well. Jack doesn't take the bait, immediately bitching about Danny making a mess in the lobby. His glass. I don't know exactly how to break this to you, but Danny's seven years old. He continues complaining, with Wendy trying to get his mind and other things off. I've got something for you you're not going to find in any of those boxes. If you want it. There might be a flashlight in there, lady. You don't know. Uh, later, maybe. Okay. Later, maybe? What is this later? They bicker back and forth a bit, but Wendy starts laying it on thick. I mean, maybe I could use some caretaking, too. And Jack really acts confused as to what the fuck she's implying. What are you talking about? She wants to fuck you, dumbass. Danny's been asleep for almost an hour now. And I want to go to bed with you. Sleep is the very last thing I'm interested in. And if I have to be any more blunt than that, we're in a lot of trouble. I'll be up in a few minutes, okay? I promise. Wrong answer, Jack. A little frustrated, Wendy lays into Jack about his old drinking habits, and while he's sober, they're resurfacing once again, blaming the hotel as a cause. He retorts back, claiming the hotel isn't doing anything to him, but merely that he's found an interest in the papers from down in the cellar. She brings up Jack abandoning his play, which fires him up a little. Has Danny been up in my office? Hmm? Has he been fooling around with my papers? Damn nosy little pup. She continues laying into him, saying he's talking like his father, wiping his mouth and chewing on aspirin like he did as a drunk. But no, no, it's all because he's stressed. Is stress the reason you don't want to make love to me anymore? Yikes. The scene meanders around here a little, where Wendy pleads to leave the hotel as it's not doing them any good. Danny looks haunted as if he's seen things, but he doesn't say anything because he's scared that Jack will lose the job. You know who else is scared about what'll happen to us if I lose this job? I am. I have visions of us ending up in California, maybe picking grapes and lettuces alongside all the illegals from Mexico, eh? Danny won't have to go to high school to learn a second language. How nice for him! That is so ridiculous! Racist Jack Ark, let's fucking go! They start yelling at each other, digging into their past trauma of possessive and abusive parents as argument points. Not even five seconds go by, and now they're calmed down, where Wendy reminisces on the old times, when they were free and happy. Jack breaks down, the guilt of bitching things up washing over him. I know how much I bitch things up for myself. The booze, the temper, the George Hatfield incident, and breaking Danny's arm. All I meant to do, I swear, all I meant to do was just hold him by the wrist and, and turn him around and just give him a little swat on the butt, that's all. The contrast between this version of retelling the events compared to the film is just, wow. Night and day. Totally different scenes. Jack starts getting excited when talking about the story of the Overlook, with Wendy donning the same expression my ex-girlfriend had when I talked about Nine Inch Nails with her. I feel like they're all still here. And they never really checked out, and I could, I could almost see them. Damn, this motherfucker crazy. He goes on to say that it felt like he was meant to be there, that his whole life had led up to this point. This acts as the genesis of the hotel's possession and influence over Jack. He begs Wendy to bear with him, to stay at the hotel, just for the winter. As seen before, they make up and make out. Fortunately for them, 
This time there isn't a swarm of wasps terrorizing their child to interrupt Coitus. On December 9th, we have a returning fan favorite. The hedge animals are back. Jack trudges through the snow to a miniature dollhouse of the Overlook. And speaking of which, seems like they forgot to cover the trees and roof of the hotel again. Oops. Jack larps as a giant, muttering to himself as we get dramatic push-ins of hedge animals covered in snow. What exactly is the point of him brushing off the snow on this miniature, and he only does one small corner of it? Is this entire scene just an excuse to get Jack outside for the schlock that's about to unfold? Also, why aren't the swing seats covered in snow either? Where did that hundred grand go? While swinging and singing to himself, he notices movement. A hedge animal, no longer covered in snow. Back at the miniature, a croquet mallet leans against the wall. I think they were trying to imply that the broom turned into a croquet mallet, but you can clearly see that he's stuck in the snow next to the swings, because it's no longer sticking up where he put it earlier. He inspects the mallet, then notices more of the hedge animals are moving. Everything starts moving on its own. Swings, seesaws, bushes, the miniature which calls out his name. Hello, Jack. Hi, Jack. Oh. Come on in. In a fright, he takes off running, gets scared by a stationary bush, and falls with the comedic timing of a sitcom. Oh. Was that supposed to be for laughs? During a scene where you're trying to build tension? Oh. Or does the show know this is a joke of a scene? Jack gets extremely defensive when he looks at the lion hedge, which every time he looks away, they come closer, like some weeping angel from Doctor Who shit. It's locked! Sammy! You don't move while you're watching him. Jack attempts to make his way back to the hotel, but of course trips again because he's a gangly, uncoordinated bitch. You gangly, uncoordinated bitch. I am not getting locked out of your lack of grace. We are then treated to a montage of Jack tripping and falling over and over again. Finally, he makes it past the topiary. They're all conveniently back to normal. Not only that, but the mallet he was holding has reverted back to the broom. Tired. <laughs> tired. Very tired. So am I. We get numerous back-to-back -back establishing shots of the hotel, with the hedge animal sprinkled in for good measure, which lasts far too long, until it's December 20th, Christmas time. A weather forecast alerts Wendy that a blizzard is heading towards Sidewinder as she works on art. Sober life is beginning to take its toll on Jack, reciting Alcoholics Anonymous meetings by himself. While going off on a little tangent, he's interrupted by the CB radio. And don't, Jackie! Shut up that drivel. Daddy? <laughs> Aren't you dead? Death doesn't mean much in the Overlook, don't you know that? Jack's father begins berating his son, name-calling and demeaning him, breaking Jack down to an infantile state. You're foolish and you're weak, Jackie. You're still just a pup. Ah, that's where Jack got it from. Showing the cyclical nature of abuse, with Jack becoming exactly like his father was. Because a certain person a certain small person is where he doesn't belong. Again. Something I actually like about this scene is that Steven Weber got a nosebleed in the middle of this shot and they just kept rolling with it. Pretty intense, honestly. Danny seems to be lured back to room 217, still cautious of that fucking fire hose. In this iteration, we actually witness Danny entering the room, while in the 80s film we never see the sequence on screen for a couple of reasons. <coughs> the door closes on its own as the episode cuts to commercial. They've betrayed you, Jackie, both of them. And they have to be punished. 
Jack's father is playing the role of Grady from the bathroom scene in the 80s film, but using the miniseries catchphrases to do so. Make him take his medicine. Jack pushes back against his father, taking the mallet that's conveniently laid against the table next to the radio and... just absolutely destroys it. You fucking moron, what are you doing? He blames the radio being smashed on Danny later too, it, like it's hilarious. This scene does play out in the film, but towards the tail end of the second act, right before things really start hitting the fan, and executed in a far more disturbing and methodical fashion. I think he realizes the error of his ways pretty quickly, as he begins breaking down and sobbing to himself. <laughs> We meet Danny back in room 217, which seems like any old normal hotel room, while in the film, there's a real presence to the room. It's unnatural, with unique carpets and color palettes. Here, just some boring room. Danny fights against the ghostly whispers calling to him until they go away. Then he just starts singing Old MacDonald to calm himself down. Why are you even here in the first place? Just leave. You've already proven your point that the hotel can't influence you like it can your father. Which, now that I think about it, doesn't this disprove that theory? He continues on, opening the door to the bathroom, noticing a woman in the tub. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How many fucking times are you gonna count and do this shtick? Oh my fucking god. He opens his eyes and she's gone, but still pushes forward to check if she's behind the curtain anyways. <laughs> To give the miniseries some credit, I actually like the design of the woman in the tub. The remaining makeup effects in the series drop off in quality rather drastically, but this one I find to be impressive. Hello, Danny. I've been waiting for you. We've all been waiting for you. <gasps> Danny books it out of the room, fiddling with the doorknob as she gets out of the tub. Jesus Christ, kid, just slow down a second. Have you never opened a door before? As the woman approaches, you can kind of see where the makeup starts and ends on her feet, but who cares, honestly. Not there! Not there! See? That wasn't so bad. Just had to swing it open. Now that that's been taken care of. That was. <laughs> oh, of course. As Wendy takes a nap, Jack notices the master key missing for the second floor, then looks back to the CB radio that he just destroyed, confused as to why it's broken, and blames Danny for it. Danny. Did the hotel make him forget that he busted it up or something? Jack takes the mallet in hand, getting a newfound determination and confidence within him. You better not be where I think you are. Jack enters the main lobby, yelling at Danny from the staircase to come down waking up Wendy. Come down here and take your medicine! Just as he's about to storm up the stairs, Wendy comes from around the corner asking what's going on. Your son broke the CB, smashed it with a croquet mallet, this croquet mallet. Okay, sure dude, yeah, whatever you say. He continues yelling about Danny misbehaving, declaring that he is the caretaker, until Wendy has to forcibly take the mallet out of his hands. Are you sure the CB is actually broken? Ugh, does the Pope wear a tall hat? Danny! Such a weird thing to say in response. Was that like a 90s retort back in the day or something? They argue if Danny was the one who did it, but Jack claims it surely wasn't him. And it sure wasn't the rats. Danny! They run upstairs to find Danny atop the railing, looking dazed and confused, with some lipstick and bruises on his neck. Wendy, correctly, assumes that Jack was the one who did this. Because at this point, he's already physically abused Danny numerous times, including at the hotel. You know, will you stop with that crap? <laughs> Eddie, what happened? Who did this? Don't what? you touch him. If you so much as lay a finger on him again, I will wait till you're asleep and I will kill you. Hell yeah, fucking kill me too while you're at it. Mommy, sorry, mommy, sorry, mommy. <laughs> this time breaking his arm wasn't enough. I didn't see him all afternoon, Danny boy. I'll get crucified here, son. She makes a run to the bedroom, attempting to call for emergency, but the phone lines are down. All forms of communication lost. They're isolated. Wendy tries to comfort Danny singing Christmas songs as her son blankly stares off into the distance. Jack enters the room, trying the phone but to no avail, then makes some small talk about the winter storm that's approaching. I don't know what's going on here, Wendy, but I did not touch him. Well, as someone recently said, it wasn't me, Jack, and it sure as hell wasn't the rats. Jack kneels down, noticing that his shirt is wet, and that lipstick stains his cheek. I think it's lipstick. Not my shade. Fuck my drag, right? The woman from the tub appears, snapping Danny out of his shell shocked state. <gasps> Daddy, oh, Daddy, oh, Daddy! It was her! It was her! It was her! 
This catches Wendy by surprise, who now finds herself in defense mode. I would never! I know you would never. <gasps> it's not nice to be accused, is it? After things have calmed down a little, the Torrances reconvene in the kitchen, making some hot chocolate for Danny. Jack asks the question on everyone's mind. What the fuck was that? I... I don't know, I think, uh... It's getting to people, Dad, the tension. What happened? Well, we know what happened. It was a ghost. In the film, however, that's up for debate. We'll get to that in a second. Danny tells his father that he wanted to keep his promise, but it was like something was making him enter the room. He goes on to say that the lipstick came from the lady after she kissed him. Danny, what are you talking about? What lady? The 217 lady. And she was joking me that I gotta breathe. Danny proposes that they have to leave the hotel. Everything bad that has happened here is still here, and that the hotel itself wants them. All of them. But most of all, I think it wants me the most. Danny claims the hotel wants him because of his shiny abilities, as the Overlook can shine too. He says he could make them go away at first, but they're getting stronger. They're coming out of the book. Jack questions him, asking if he's really claiming that he was strangled by a ghost. There are ghosts here. I know there are. He says the hotel wants Jack too to make him do the bad thing again. Jack pops off a little, saying that he hasn't been drinking for a while now and there's no liquor in the building. I think the bad thing Danny is referring to might be you beating the shit out of him too, not just drinking. He continues to say that they need to leave the hotel because if they don't soon, they might not be able to again. Halloran said that what they might see in the hotel can't hurt them, but he was wrong. They're becoming more real day by day. <laughs> After we come back from commercial, we're reminded of the plot device again. Pressure's looking pretty high there. Surely you won't forget to relieve some of that. Right? Right? Back in the kitchen, it's revealed to Wendy of all the crimes and murders that have been committed at the Overlook. The gangsters and bodyguards being shot up, the lady from room 217 killing herself in the bathroom, and something that happened down by the hedge animals. Did you see anything down there, Jack? No. Why would you lie about that? Everything is being laid out on the table. Your son is recounting all the ghostly shit he's experienced. Why are you denying being chased by some fucking bushes? Jack turns around to leave. Investigate room 217. But Wendy pleads for him not to go. Please don't leave us alone, Jack. Let me do my job, Wendy. What, as caretaker of this hotel? Is that what you're willing to risk all of our lives for? Jack doubles down, as it's not just for the caretaker of the hotel, but also for his wife and for his son leaving with a Terminator reference for whatever reason. I'll be back. On his way to room 217, he arms himself with his signature weapon, the croquet mallet. Now, before we go any further, let's take a look at how the 80s film handled Danny entering room 237 and the subsequent unraveling of the trust and sanity between the family unit. After the bedroom sit-down meeting from hell, we see the hotel covered in snow. There is no escaping. Danny plays with his toy cars, still missing that fire engine. The composition, The Awakening of Jacob, swarms our ears as we zoom out to see a tennis ball roll into Danny's arrangement of cars against the hexagons. The same tennis ball Jack was throwing around earlier. Danny wears an Apollo 11 shirt, adding to the television motifs, with some interpretations seeing the shirt as Kubrick confessing to faking the moon landing. And this deeper story has its uh, birth, I guess, uh, in the idea that uh, Stanley Kubrick was involved with faking the Apollo moon landing. Mom! Danny pushes forward as we now gain his perspective. The door to room 237 has been opened, keys still hanging from the lock. Just as we enter, we crossfade to Wendy checking equipment downstairs from within the boiler room, which doesn't fucking explode at the end of the film. Wendy hears her husband shouting from a nightmare in the main lobby. <laughs> As she runs over to Jack, Wendy passes over a large bear rug. If sticking to the narrative that bears symbolically represent sexual abuse, inferred by these scenes with Danny laying on top of a bear pillow after the incident, two bears hanging above his headboard in his room, which shares the same space as that scene, Winnie the Pooh hiding in the corner of this scene we haven't gotten to yet, and that scene, which I'm not gonna show yet for dramatic effect in part three, Wendy passing over the bear rug informs us exactly what happened within room 237. Jack lured Danny in with that same tennis ball and sexually abused his son, again. As Wendy catches up to Jack, he falls onto the floor, manically recalling the most horrible dream he's ever had. I dreamed that I, that I killed you and Danny. 
but I didn't just kill you. I cut you up into little pieces. What I love about this scene is the different ways you can interpret it. On one hand, this scene could be the last resemblance of sanity, morality, and humanity that Jack has be stripped away from him, sending him on a downward spiral into deluded realities and mental psychosis. Or Jack has already snapped, days, weeks, even months ago, before he even got to the hotel, and all of this is a ruse. Just another manipulation tactic, psychologically tormenting his wife with tales of butchering his family. As Wendy consoles her husband, in comes Danny, slowly walking into the lobby with his shirt torn, a symbol of innocence, torn by the hands of the protector. Wendy approaches, telling Danny to go back to his room, Danny. until she notices. Oh my God. Danny, what happened to your neck? Reality begins crashing down as Wendy looks towards her husband in utter bewilderment, a mix of shock terror, disgust, and fear washes over. Her husband, his father, has abused Danny. Again. You did this to him! You son of a bitch! You did this to him! How could you? How could you? Wendy leaves to take her son to safety, getting away from her husband. Jack looks perplexed, forgetting the atrocities he committed. As we crossfade to the hallway leading to the gold room, I'm reminded of how compelling this film is. Every time a new scene starts, I get giddy with excitement. Like, yes, now we're getting to this scene. Now we're getting to this scene. Oh god, oh fuck, we're getting to this scene. One of the most iconic sequences in the film, Jack makes his way to the gold room. As he passes each of the mirrors, his body language exaggerates, as if he's fighting off his demons in every reflection, swearing them off and stuffing them back down in the final mirror. Jack enters the empty ballroom, meeting his reflection as he takes a seat at the bar. It's at this point I must confess something. There are no ghosts in the Kubrick film. Every instance can be explained away as visual representations of Jack's deluded reality, many of which are in the presence of mirrors. Other sequences are simply physical metaphors the characters are witnessing, not actually based in reality. So, when Jack says, This is Kubrick's way of still maintaining horror tropes, leaning into the idea of selling his soul to the hotel to start drinking again, despite this entire scene taking place within Jack's head. As he peels his fingers down his eyes, his demeanor changes. Now, we are introduced to Lloyd the bartender. A little slow tonight, isn't it? <laughs> Revealing a fully stocked bar and personal bartender. An alcoholic's dream come true. Fully deluded into his warped perspective, Jack expresses great joy when ordering. Shortly after, we get a line which refers back to the underlying racism and western expansion themes within the film, commenting on the genocide of Native Americans. White man's burden, Lloyd, my man. White man's burden. White man's burden is an ideal which came from a poem during the Philippine-American War, essentially giving justification to white imperialists to manage the affairs of non-white people whom they believe to be less developed. This was seen as a natural extension of Manifest Destiny and brought in a new wave of supposed moral obligation to civilize the non-white peoples of the world, which ultimately led to the genocide of millions and millions of indigenous peoples around the world, including the Native Americans, which just so happened to be taking place during the construction of the Overlook Hotel in 1907. Construction started in 1907. It's finished in 1909. The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. Anyways, turns out that Jack is temporarily light on cash, but Lloyd assures him that his credit is fine, which excites Jack greatly. Best goddamn bartender from Timbuktu to Portland, Maine. Or Portland, Oregon, for that matter. Further commenting on the themes of white man's burden yet again after Jack takes his first drink in five months. We're reminded of a face he makes multiple times throughout the film, where his eyes seem to roll to the back of his head. In this moment, it's ecstasy. In others, it's wrath. And the final being defeat. Lloyd asks Jack how things are going, who relays that things could be a whole lot better. Tapping his glass for another drink, Jack goes on a psychotic rant about his family. Just a little problem with the uh, old sperm bank upstairs. <laughs> Now, this is up for interpretation of who he's referring to. The obvious answer is his wife, Wendy, but the more disturbing, if following through with the theory, is that it's about Danny. 
Jack's delusion further escalates as he now becomes an unreliable narrator, claiming that he never laid a hand on him, only to retract his statement a few moments later. I never laid a hand on him, goddammit. I didn't. I did hurt him once, okay? It was an accident. The inconsistencies continue. It was three goddamn years ago! As it was implied by Wendy that after Danny was injured, Jack stopped hitting the bottle. He hasn't had any alcohol in uh, five months. Here's to five miserable months on the wagon. It was three goddamn years ago! Or, that was just one of the many times Jack has abused his son. Jack continued drinking until another incident happened again. Regardless, the holes in Jack's story are starting to add up as Jack exhales. <laughs> Wendy's scream from down the hall matches his, running into the gold room frantically weeping, which, of course, reveals the bar to be completely empty. This entire conversation, speaking to himself in the mirror. Wendy, with tears in her eyes, tells Jack that there's someone else in the hotel, which leads to one of the best line deliveries in the film. Are you out of your fucking mind? Just perfect. He went up into one of the bedrooms. The door was open and he saw this crazy woman in the bathtub. She tried to strangle him. Which room was it? Great question. I realized that I never mentioned this discrepancy within my review, and what better time to talk about it than now? Room 217 was the original room King stayed in during his visit at the Stanley Hotel, which inspired him to write The Shining in the first place. Apparently, the Stanley Hotel didn't want Kubrick to use 217 out of fear that no one would rent the room at the actual hotel. He agreed, changing it to 237, as there is no room 237 at the actual hotel, but ironically enough, room 217 is one of the most booked rooms at the hotel, with months if not years in advance for reservations, although there have been a few other interpretations as to what the number change really means. Remember that moon landing conspiracy theory I mentioned a bit ago? Well, apparently, Kubrick changed it to 237 because the moon is approximately 237,000 miles away from Earth, and coupled with Danny wearing an Apollo 11 shirt, confirms that Kubrick is telling us that he faked the moon landing. Although, knowing Kubrick, he probably would have requested a film on location for authenticity. There is entire videos debunking this if you want to check it out. Just kind of entertaining, honestly. It also touches on that forced coincidence thing where, yeah, it can be if you move the numbers the right way, blah, 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 blah. Another thing about 237, if talking numbers, is that the product of 2, 3, and 7 equals 42. 1942 the year of the Holocaust. Touching on motifs of genocide again, are we? That's also why I mentioned Wendy and Danny watching the year of 42 earlier, and wait, wasn't Danny wearing a shirt with the number 42 on it? Turns out that 42 is quite the significant number. There's also entire videos diving more into this if you want to check it out. I have a whole little reoccurring thing with the number 12 myself personally, and The Shining adds to that list. For example, uh, the sum of 2, 3, and 7 equals 12. The radio station for the Overlook channel is KDK12. This is KDK12. Uh, Jack Torrance has 12 letters in his name, and at exactly 12 minutes in the film, the blood elevator sequence is happening, and okay, fuck, enough. Fucking Christ. Can we get back to the video, please? <sighs> Thank you. Halloran watches the television, learning that the Colorado area is being completely covered in snow, with travel to that area increasingly becoming impossible. More twins and mirror imagery are present even in this scene, where the two nude models hang across from each other in his room. An otherworldly presence creeps in Halloran's ear as a swelling ring and heartbeat engulfs him. A slow zoom in exposes him to the horrors currently underway at the Overlook, the events at room 237, and Danny seizing out on his bed, spittle dripping onto his shirt. We shift perspectives, now entering room 237 for the first time. A strange, foreign room with unnatural color schemes and an almost phallic-like pattern in the carpet. Kubrick utilizes some brilliant techniques to ramp up tension, which can be seen in his other works. Here, the added heartbeat mimics the audiences, causing anxiety levels to rise. A different example can be found in 2001 A Space Odyssey, where he added his own breathing for the same effect. something I shamelessly ripped off in my own short film a few years ago.
As we inch closer to the bathroom, a hand appears, pushing the door open. It can be interpreted that room 237 is the representation of Jack's id. Stemming from the Freudian model of the psyche, the id is the source of our most primal needs and wants, our emotional impulses and desires, aggression, and sexual fantasies. It acts according to the pleasure principle, and is the reason Jack lured Danny into that room gratification. When Jack enters the bathroom, the mirrors projecting his psychosis, he sees exactly what he came here for. A young, nude woman to satiate his sexual desires. An alluring smile cracks as she stands from the tub. Fiery lust filling his eyes. She slowly steps out of the tub. An invitation. As they lock lips at the intersection of primal desire and fantasy, we cut to a close-up. But something's off. Jack's fantasies now reflect that of his mental state, decaying. As he backs up, horror painting his face and disgust staining his lips, another woman with shorter hair emerges from the tub. Even she has a twin. If following through with the twin motifs, these women represent not only the twins from the hallway, Another generation of abused and slaughtered children grown to decaying widows, but Danny and his twin, Tony, who seizes out on the bed, spittle dripping from his mouth, tying the events within room 237 to reflect Danny's own experience as he shines to Halloran. Jack backs out of the room, the woman still approaching, laughing maniacally, until he locks the door, stuffing his inner desires and impulses away, deep within the chambers of his id. Halloran tries to call, but to no avail. The phone lines are down. Wendy paces the bedroom, waiting for Jack to return. A knock. And as Wendy opens the door, the first image we see of Jack is his reflection. A facade of the man he once was. Did you find anything? No. Nothing at all. I didn't see one goddamn thing. Wendy pushes more into him, really asking if he saw nothing at all, to which Jack denies. They go talk about it further on the bed, Jack reassuring her that Danny will be better in the morning. In this scene, we see Jack fully commit to manipulating his wife, disregarding the situation and deflecting the blame from himself. Once you rule out his version of what happened, there is no other explanation, is there? He compares it to the incident Danny had before they made it up to the Overlook, putting Wendy in a stun lock. Danny, from the other room, hears this interaction ring through his head as we get the first appearance of those six letters. That is how you fucking do it, not this shit. Bobby? Yeah? Wendy suggests that they need to get Danny out of here, setting Jack off. With one of the most haunting cutaways, Jack is sent into a spiral, spitting venom with his words. It is so fucking typical of you to create a problem like this when I finally have a chance to accomplish something, when I am really in my work. These are similar sentiments made earlier in the miniseries, but with far greater gravity to them here. No loving making up, no back and forth. Jack shuts it down and lets his rage flow through him. And it's terrifying. Jack. Wendy. I have let you fuck up my life so far, but I am not gonna let you fuck this up. As Jack leaves the room, he makes eye contact with the camera, breaking the fourth wall, letting us, the audience, know this is the real him. No facade here, as his reflection doesn't pass through the mirror. Wendy, defenseless and defeated, weeps on the bed. Jack lets out his frustration as he walks to the gold room, with a surprising development. There's a party. Now, let's take a look back at the miniseries and Jack's encounter with a woman in room 217. You didn't have any business up here in the first place. Right off the bat, or mallet, I suppose, there's a distinct lack of atmosphere, especially when compared to the encounter from the 80s film. He kind of just meanders around on his way to the bathroom. Hey, look, a mirror. 
except it doesn't really hold any significance in this iteration. As Jack approaches, he's met with an empty tub, which, now that I think about it, renders this room to have far less personal significance to Jack in this iteration too. Now it's kinda just a room where spooky shit happens. It's revealed that there's no one behind the curtain. Until the medicine cabinet door swings open, using some mirror tricks again. Musical sting to reveal a tube of lipstick, though. Maybe there was some truth to Danny's story. Oh look, a wet footprint. Things are really starting to add up. Suddenly, Jack hears the curtains close from the tub. He peers into the room with another musical sting, showing a figure sitting inside the bathtub. Are you really just gonna run out that quickly? Quit being a pussy and go make out with it like Jack from the 80s film did. He bolts out of the room, leaving the mallet inside. But don't worry, it'll come back later. Oh no, I don't see that. No, no! No, no! Absolutely not. Could you at least try to make it scary? Like, come on. Don't you just love dated 90s made-for-TV series? Their dramatic lighting changes with a push-in. Mwah! Chef's kiss. Just pissing. Ugh. He continues mumbling about trespassing as he chews some more aspirin, until he comes back to his family. Upon coming back to his family, he starts immediately grilling Danny, denying seeing anything in the room. Which doesn't make sense. Everything he claimed was true. The lipstick and everything. You could argue that Jack had no reason to lie in the 80s film, but that could fall under a few different reasons as to why he did that. For example, everything with the woman never actually happened. It was all in his head, a projection of his id reflected to show his own personal reality. Or that the projection itself alludes to Jack sexually abusing his son. Why would he admit to that? In the miniseries, that wasn't the case? And after being shown evidence of this, he pretends he didn't? I guess the hotel is making him lie about it? And that's why he's so hung up on the trespassing bit? Now listen to me, son. I'm not gonna spank you. I can lay a finger on you. I'm not even gonna shout. You literally already did all of these things. Oh, will you stop with that crap? <laughs> Come down here and take your medicine! Daddy! Crap. He goes on to say if he ever catches Danny with a pass key or any other key, he's gonna be in big, big trouble. Listen to yourself, Jack. You are threatening a seven-year-old boy. Just stop it. Danny pleads with his father, saying he doesn't want to go into any of the rooms. He just wants to leave before something bad happens. Wendy asks if Danny broke the CB radio, catching him off guard. It's a broken. You mean it wasn't broken when you were in there? I, 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 I what? What? Then Jack continues to mock him, fully well knowing that he was the one who broke it. I guess the miniseries is trying to suggest that anytime Jack does something relating to ghosts in any capacity, he conveniently gets amnesia. Wendy and Danny keep persisting that they need to leave, citing the snow cat is large enough to take all of them. So you know exactly what's gonna happen next scene. Jack in a fury rejects all of this. Cut and run, cut and run! Let's leave the hotel open to the elements. Let's leave the hotel open to vandals. I've got it up the boiler! Yeah, why don't you get on that, Jack? Last time I checked, you still haven't relieved the fucking thing. Can't you see the bruises on his neck? Are you blind? Look out the window. Are you blind? Zero visibility! Fuck my drag, right? The argument swells to a screaming match until Danny chimes in. Oh, you're the one! Things calm down for a moment, until Jack explains to Wendy. We can't leave tonight, babe. We would die out there. I'm telling you the plain, unpainted truth. The final shot shows the snowstorm in full effect, until we fade to commercials. Despite just yelling at his family that if they leave they'll perish in the storm, Jack decides he's gonna check out the snowcat anyways. Unveiling the tarp, the mallet he left in room 217 and a note lay atop the snowcat. Which I'm honestly surprised they didn't reveal with a musical sting. A push-in with a 90s dramatic lighting change launches us into another fucking flashback. Suddenly, we're attending the masked ball. 
an illustrious event referenced numerous times throughout the series. And hey, it's the dog mask. Underneath it is the man himself, Derwent. Going into a full psychosis, Jack has a meeting with Mr. Derwent, who mocks him as a drunk who cuts and runs, taunting him on his fears of having to work in California, perhaps as a sale clerk in a mall or at a car wash. That's what your wife and your wealth want, isn't it? To see you working in that sort of a job. To see you properly humbled. Huh. Sounds familiar. Shoveling out driveways, working in a car wash, will get that appeal to you? Persuaded by his predecessors, Jack seizes the opportunity to fully commit to his job as the caretaker of the Overlook Hotel. Unmask. Do you hear that? I think there's a party. Good evening, Mr. Torrance. Good evening. The gold room is now packed with Roaring Twenties partygoers. Quite the stark change from just a few scenes ago. Smoke fills the room as champagne is poured. Lloyd is serving up drinks to patrons. Sitting at the bar, Lloyd and Jack have a playful conversation as he orders bourbon on the rocks. Hair of the dog that bit me. Jack's demeanor has completely shifted. He's comfortable, completely in his environment, as if he's always been here. When pulling out the cash he was missing earlier, Lloyd refuses, saying that his money's no good here. Orders from the house. Jack insists he likes to know who's paying for his drinks, but Lloyd retorts that it's not a matter that concerns him. At least, not at this point. Jack seems uncharacteristically... joyful? He dances around, but when peeling back the layers, shows a man dancing to no music. His delusions and psychosis fully developing an entire scene, rich with life and character. Even when a waiter spills a tray on him, he passes it off, not raising his temper in the slightest. After the waiter insists washing the avocado off as it tends to stain, Jack heads over to the gentleman's room. Ooh, so fancy. Leading us to the scene that changes the fates of the Torrance family and sets Jack off into corrective action. Hold this for you there. To use it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, let's see if we can improve this with a... Little waters are. The blocking in this scene aligns perfectly with not only the mirror motifs, but also the thematic implications as seen earlier in the film, with Jack facing the mirror and the waiter mirroring his stance. What do they call you around here, Jeezy? Grady, sir. Delbert Grady. An intentional break of the 180 degree roll implies that these two are mirrored in more Grady? ways than one. Jack grows suspicious, asking if he's seen Grady somewhere before. Why no, sir. <laughs> I don't believe so. Jack doesn't buy it, asking about his position as the winter caretaker, if he's a married man, and where his daughters are, all to which Grady denies knowing anything about. Jack pushes forward, insisting that he was the winter caretaker here, that he saw his picture in the newspaper. You, uh, chopped your wife and daughter up into little bits, and uh, then you blew your brains out. With this line, Jack admits that all along, he knew about the tragedy of 1970 before Ullman made mention of it, acting like it was completely new information, pretending to be taken back and disturbed by it in the interview. All for show. He knew, seeing it in the papers 10 years prior, purposefully taking his family here, full well knowing what was gonna happen. A self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, there's a lot of debate about Grady's name. Is it Charles, like Ullman mentioned during the interview? or Delbert, like how he introduced himself here. Honestly, I don't know. It's possible that Charles and Delbert are twins themselves, both having committed familicide to their own families within the Overlook, killing their own wives and twin daughters respectively. It wouldn't be too far-fetched, as Jack came here for that exact same reason, if subscribing to the narrative that Danny and Tony are also symbolically twins, right? Or, considering this is all within Jack's head, his psychosis may be progressing to the point of false memories embedding within his warped reality, mixing the names up. I mean, either way, Jack is projecting his unconscious desire to slaughter his family in the form of Grady, a figure that acted upon his impulses and stayed true to his own duties as the Winter Caretaker, besides the whole putting a shotgun in his mouth bit. Another break of the 180 further cements the mirrored connection between Jack and Grady. Jack is looking into his reflection, the man he will soon become. And again, Grady goes on to emphasize that Jack has always been the caretaker, 
as if he's always been here, looping back to the foreshadowing from the beginning of their stay, when Jack tells Wendy, When I came up here for my interview, it was as though I'd been here before. I mean, we all have moments of deja vu, but this was ridiculous. And with this follow-up from Grady, I should know, sir. I've always been here. The themes of cyclical abuse shine brightly in this scene. The duties of the caretaker, the father, passed down from generation to generation. The abuse, the neglect, the violence, cycling through the bloodline, turning victims into future perpetrators, forever in perpetuity. Once the abused, always the caretaker. We break from the two shot as Jack processes this information. <laughs> Grady having some time sensitive information. Did you know, Mr. Torrance, that your son is attempting to bring an outside party into this situation? When in reality, this is Jack reminding himself of Halloran, who he must have seen make a connection with Danny. This scene also further enforces the racist undertones within the film, transforming them into racist overtones. A n -a. A n -a. A n -a. Cook. Grady informs Jack that his son has a very great talent, who is attempting to use that great talent against his will. He is a very wonderful boy. A rather naughty boy, if I may be so bold. <laughs> Jack goes on to blame Wendy, referring to her as Danny's mother, distancing himself from her in disgust, saying that she interferes. Grady then suggests that they need a good talking to. Perhaps a bit more. Grady tells Jack how his daughters didn't care for the Overlook at first, with one of them trying to burn it down, possibly not at the novel, but he corrected them. And when my wife tried to prevent me from The foundation is laid out. Jack now has one thing on his mind, the correction of those who interfere with his duties at the Overlook, by any means necessary. If Jack won't come with us. Wendy paces around the room, talking to herself. We'll just have to tell him that we're going by ourselves. As she lays out a plan, a shimmering score and heartbeat fill our ears. Chants of red rum come from Danny's room, but Danny is absent. Red Rum! Danny, what's the matter, honey? Red Rum! You having a bad dream? Danny's not here, Mrs. Torrance. Wendy's pleading falls on deaf ears as Tony now encompasses his body. Danny's gone away, Mrs. Torrance. Wendy holds Tony in her arms, wishing to wake up from this nightmare. As Jack calmly walks over to Olman's office, the CB radio chanting. Get it, get one. The last line of defense sits in front of Jack, a man already far past the breaking point. Methodically, he dismantles the radio, picking apart the insides one by one, sealing his family's fate, rather than awkwardly smashing it in a childlike fit. Halloran contacts KDK-1, confirming that all communications are in the dark. Realizing the severity of the situation, Halloran begins his journey all the way back to Sidewinder. The Torrance family is now completely closed off to the outside world, as the clock ticks down to the final hours. Back in the miniseries, Jack barges into the room, demanding Wendy to put on her coat, where she discovers the Snowcat's engine smashed to pieces. Smashed, just like the radio. Just like the radio. Wendy, obviously, assumes it was Jack, because who the fuck else would do it, but Jack, obviously, won't admit to smashing it since he was possessed by the hotel, so she just assumes someone must be in the hotel with them. Then there has to be someone else here. While technically she's not wrong, as in this version there are without a doubt ghosts, but she doesn't really know that. Jack denies this, saying it must have been Danny, citing his shining abilities. There's another side to him, and we both know this. Don't you remember when he was a baby? 
Sometimes if his formula was late or if he had a bellyache, things had a way of tipping over. Glasses would break. Don't you remember how sometimes the toilet would flush itself over and over, like five minutes at a time? Nothing like that has happened in years, Jack. The broken CB in Ullman's office wasn't years ago, sweetheart. That was last night. They conclude that the hotel must be channeling through Danny to keep the Torrances here at the hotel. Then it succeeded. Yeah, through you, dumbass. Wendy desperately tries to come up with a plan, but Jack shuts it down. Even if they pick a time where the weather dies down for a few days. And if the forecast is wrong, and another storm comes in, if that happens, I think the three of us might die. Somewhere between here and Sidewinder. Just like the Donners. Jack assures Wendy that when the first park rangers show up to give a wellness check, her and Danny are gone, but Jack will stay behind to care for the hotel. December 29th brings us a few days after Christmas, where Wendy is cleaning the windows outside in a flannel? Isn't that a little light considering you've been blasted with snowstorms for the past few weeks? Hey, at least they got snow on the roof this time. Danny builds a snow fort, and with this dramatic push-in and musical sting, you know what time it is. That's right, the hedge animals are back, baby! This time, planning an all-out attack on Danny. Okay, turns out she's cleaning the windows inside. After hearing a disturbance from the other room, she goes to track it down, thinking Jack is fucking around somewhere. Which he is, but in a completely different part of the hotel, reading through more newspaper clippings. The hedges are slowly closing in on Danny, blissfully unaware of the threat that encroaches upon him. As Wendy wanders through the halls looking for Jack, a croquet ball is rolled out of Ullman's office. Wendy sees the completely demolished office, still calling out for Jack as if it's not completely apparent he's not in here. Jack? Are you in here? Until the door to Ullman's office closes on its own, trapping Wendy. She screams and screams for her husband to help her, save her from this nightmare. But he's too busy getting aroused by gangsters committing crimes 50 years ago. In the closing shot of the episode, we are treated to some groundbreaking 90s CGI in all of its glory. Will Danny survive the pathetic ambush from the hedge animals? Will Wendy escape Ullman's office and protect her son? Will Jack fuck this hot ghost lady? All of this and more in the epic conclusion of the Shining miniseries.